You took that puppy to the vet. You trained that puppy. You did everything you could for that puppy. But one day that puppy grew up and became a dog. And out of nowhere, for no reason unbeknown to you, that dog bit the living daylights out of you. Now, let's say you had a child, many of us do, your son, your daughter, your grandchild. You loved that child when it was still in the belly. You raised that child. You took that child to the doctor. And whatever issues that child had to face, you were there for that child. You fed and you clothed that child. That child growed up. And let's say the child, for some reason out of nowhere, began to disrespect you in some kind of way. And you, you embraced that child. You grabbed that child and you said, I love you. And that child looked you straight in your face straight into your eyes, and said, in what way have you loved me? How would that make you feel? Well, this is the same way that our story is unfolding about this group of people in the Old Testament. Can someone read the book of Malachi, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5? I have someone, Clark. The book of Malachi 1, 1 through 5. This is the message that the Lord gave to Israel through the prophet Malachi, the Lord's love of Israel. I have always loved you. I have always loved you. That is, I do love you. Continue. Says the Lord. But you report, retort, really. How have you loved us? Isn't that something? Right there is a challenge. They want God to explain how have he loved them. Continue, please. And the Lord replied, this is how I showed my love for you. Now the I, Lord answers. Uh -huh. I loved your ancestor, jo um, Jacob, but I rejected his brother, Esau. Esau. And devastated his heel country. I turned Esau's inheritance into a desert of, for jackals. Esau's descendants and Enoch, I'm sorry, Edom, may say, we have been shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins. But the Lord of Heaven's armies reply, replies, they may try to rebuild, but I will demolish them again. Their country will be known as the Lord of wickedness. I'm sorry, the land of wickedness. And their people will be called the people with whom the Lord is forever angry. When you see the destruction for yourselves, you will say, truly, the Lord's greatness reaches far beyond Israel's borders. Amen. The title of the book characterized this prophet as a burden, this prophecy as a burden. In other words, the oracle includes here, will be heavy and stern, warnings and rebukes. But the message also consolate, is also a consolator. They are not against Israel, but to Israel. And there are hopeful notes of forgiveness and blessing and joy if the people would heed this warning. How many times have God warned us in our lives? What's love? got to do with it. 
The question raised the significance of love in a relationship. Hmm. What does love got to do with it? Can someone in this session, just out of your own thought, tell us, what does love got to do with it? Anybody besides Mark? Anybody in this section? Okay. Oh, when, you love, <laughs> when you love something, it makes you work hard for it, or it makes you go the extra mile. Amen? My sister? When you love someone, um, then it's important to you. It's a uh, priority in your life. And as Sister Janine said, you do, well, you do everything you can for that person or whatever it is. Wow, you do everything you can. Wow. Hmm. Brother Clark. Yes. To your left. I was saying that love has everything to do with it. For God to love us so much, this, that much that he sent his only son, that's love. That's, that's past love. You know, he loves us that much. Amen. You are exactly right. Love has everything to do with every meaningful relationship in life, especially our relationship with God. So Tina Turner made that song, What's Love Got to Do With It? And in rhetorical, her, the thought was nothing. Because we know Tina Turner had a bad relationship. Right. You know, so in that bad relationship, her experience of love was, this can't be love. No, love is nothing. But love has everything to do with every important relationship especially our relationship with God. Let's just go over some, some words real quick. Cynical. Believing that people are motivated by self-interest, distrustful of human sincerity or integrity. Apathy. Lack of interest, enthusiasm, or concern. Erroneous, wrong, incorrect. Precipitate, cause an event or situation, typically one that is bad or undesirable, to happen subtly, unexpectedly, or prematurely. On page chapter seven, on page seven, excuse me, where it says, when Malachi comes on the scene, can someone read that? The last chapter. <coughs> when Malachi comes on the scene, page seven. When Malachi comes on the scene in the fifth century BC, 450 to 430, he opens up, he opens his prophetic oracle addressing the same critical question. What's love got to do with it? Malachi 1 verse two. The people had returned from exile. The temple had been rebuilt and a sacrificial system reestablished. However, there was no true love and devotion for the Lord. Can you imagine that? Ooh, that's deep. Read that one more time. The whole thing? No, just that, that part. The going. people had returned from exile. The temple had been rebuilt and the sacrificial system reestablished. However, there was no true love and devotion for the Lord. Keep reading, please. Worship had degenerated into empty rituals. The people were cynical and questioned the benefits of living a godly life. The priests and the people were in violation of God's law concerning sacrifices, tithes, offerings, morals, divorce, and marriage. At the heart of this spiritual apathy, was their erroneous theology of a loveless God. 
looking only at what they had lost since the captivity and how feeble their ration their nation was god's people questioned his love this cynicism precipitated a spirit of indifference and apathy towards god malachi reveals to us that love for god and the love of god has everything to do with life and worship amen However, there was no true love and devotion for the Lord. Devotion. Love, loyalty, or enthusiasm for a person, activity, or cause. Religious worship or observance. Prayers or religious observance. Deep love or loyalty. An act of giving as effort or time. Let's think about this uh, in this moment. Someone give me one word that describe these people you come up with in this sentence. However, there was no true love and devotion for the Lord. So anybody in this section, just give me one word. What'd you say? Okay, wait for the microphone. I'm, I'm grateful. Amen. Somebody in this section, one word. Apathy. Apathy, amen. Somebody in this section, one word. How there was no true love and devotion for the Lord. Anybody? Ungrateful? That was said, right? Okay. You got another one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Somebody in this section. One word. We got two brothers over here. Weak. Amen. Somebody in this section? Disconnected. Amen. We got two sisters over here. One word. <laughs> Apathetic. Okay, good. Very good. We could use uh, words like backslide, neglect, erroneous, indifference, you know, which is words <laughs> that are in the lesson. <laughs> uh, false, incorrect, untrue, wrong. It's a lot of different words we could have used. Their Sister. worship had declined. Brother Clark. I just had a comment about this. Um, you know, I'm thinking about, and I don't, I don't mean to throw you off, so mm -hmm. forgive me if that's what I'm doing, but I, I you know, I'm thinking about uh, um, Tina Turner's song, What's Love Got to Do With It? Mm -hmm. When I think of that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that, you know, she loved her partner and no matter how much she loved him he mistreated her and so it's the same way with God's people you know he loves us unconditionally amen and regardless of how much he loves us we still act up we still misbehave we still don't follow his well word said. and and so for me you know when you talk about the word love you know, that's, that's something that just doesn't die. You just love no matter how much you get hurt. Even if you separate yourself from someone, you can still love them, but they're hurting you. And, and I just feel like that's what God is, the author is describing to us how God must have felt. Amen. Amen. You know, we hurt God every day. Imagine having to get used to being hurt every day. by the people that you love. Let's imagine that. Your son, your daughter, your grandchild. Imagine being hurt every day by someone you love. And this is God. 
because we are always sinning. We not be, not be uh, how can I say it? We, not, we might not be in a state of sin or we, we sin it all the time. But every now and then, somewhere in our life, we sin. But thank God, glory be to God, for Christ Jesus, that we can repent of that sin. And God will embrace us again. Amen. Their worship had declined or deteriorated physically, mentally, or morally into empty rituals. Empty rituals. Do we know or how can we tell when our worship declined into empty rituals? It becomes meaningless. It becomes meaningless. Anybody else? How can we tell when our worship becomes an empty ritual? We got two. Um, one way is when we come and just spectate instead of participate. Amen. When we are just a spectator instead of a participator. I think we had Janine over there. Um, when you come, we don't give you an answer to anything. It's just nothing to it. We're just here. And our mind could be somewhere else. Wow, when we're here, but our mind is somewhere else. When we don't apply the word of God, when we learn it when we come to class and we don't apply it every day. Always learning, but never applying. Tangela? Oh. Well, we come in late, um, and, or we're on our cell phone with something other than um, God's word. Um, we're um, distracting others, doing other things. Um, we're just disrupting the service, you know, and we're not giving God his glory. Amen. Amen. Mark? I was just telling my wife, it's interesting uh, when you talked about worship. All the comments focused on the Lord's Day worship and not our daily service. Amen. We can be ritualistic in our daily service as well. Amen. Thank you, my brother. You know, sometimes it starts off by missing a day of worship. And we tell ourselves, oh, I'll go next week. Then we miss next week. Oh, I'll go next week. And then we miss next week. Also, <clears throat> excuse me, I think we, we lose our zeal for worship. You know, mm -hmm. it's like even if we come every week, it's like it's an, kind of like an expectation as opposed to a desire to worship and be with other Christians. Mm. So we are pretending. Brother Maurice? You, you just said a word that I was about to use. When I, when I think of rituals, I think of, you know, acting out something. You know, doing something that, you know, pretending to do something that we not actually, we don't actually want to do or intend to do. You know, we're just acting it out to make it look good. So. Hey, Amen. We're just making it look good. Oh, Sister Brenda, you know, you, you here every Sunday. Girl, you know, how's everything going, blah, 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 blah. As long as I see Sister Brenda here, I, I believe Sister Brenda got her, her life together with Christ Jesus. But Sister Brenda is just pretending 
to have a relationship right with God. You know, that could happen to either one of us. Amen. That's why we have to always study, show ourselves approved unto God. Do we know, well, how can we tell when our worship declined into empty rituals? A spiritual disconnection from oneself, from others, and from God. Lack of spiritual hope and joy, a feeling of nothingness, despair. We are coming to worship and getting nothing out of it. Because we are just not there. Sister Putin. Amen. That's up to you. Let's come over here. What do you put into worship? Say it again. I worship God in spirit and in truth. Amen. Amen. You got to worship God in spirit and in truth. What else do you put into it? Over here. Attentiveness. So when you say attentiveness, you're talking about devotion, dedication. Amen. My brother? That's why I mentioned the daily service. Because when you look at uh, Israel in this day of Malachi, their actual worship in the temple was reflective of their life. So when we talk about what do you put into it, you can't put into it what doesn't exist. Amen. So really what we see today in ourselves today is a reflection of our life. Mm. So if our life is mm. on E, our worship will be too. Mm. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Come with the mic, sis. Pose. Here you go, right here. Right attitude. Say it again. Right attitude. Right attitude. Amen. Man. Woo. That's a good one. Right attitude. Debbie? And are we singing and praying? Are we, you know, are we praying when our brothers are praying? Or are we thinking, okay, I got to get this at the store, and I got to do this when I get home? You know, so we're truly supposed to be singing with the song leader mm -hmm. and then praying when they're praying. And then Amen. listening to the sermon, of course, but, you know. Uh, so are we singing with the understanding, and are we praying alone in fellowship with the person that's praying? Amen. Uh, do we really believe or are we just here? Do we really believe or are we just here? Wow, are we just here? That's a good question. Do we really believe or are we just here? You know, that's, that's really a good question. Because I've known people who grew up in the body of Christ and still think that it's okay to go worship anywhere. They still believe that any other worship service outside of God worship service is justifiable. So do we truly believe? Because if we truly believe, we will stick with what thus says the Lord. Amen. 
the people were cynical, believing that people are motivated by self-interest, distrust of human sincerity or integrity, and question the benefits of living a godly life. God's people question his love. Um, we were talking about belief, and the Greek word escapes me right this moment, but it means to live by. So if you believe you live by God's word, then like Mark says, your worship will be daily because you're living it every day. It is who you are. It's not what you do. So it's not a Sunday thing. Mm -hmm. It's a lifestyle thing. Amen. It's who I am Amen. all the time. I never take it off because it's in me. Just like when I went down in that watery grave of baptism and I put on Christ, it's not in me. It's who I am. And so I live by my belief that, you know, God is, uh, that Christ is the son of God and that the promises he has made, he will, he will honor because he has in the past. You know, we have, we have the Old Testament as our uh, reference, you know, to know that when God gives his word, he will come through. And we know that God is infallible. His character does not change. You know, we're the ones who don't want to make the change. We want to have things our way and still be blessed by God. Amen. Well said. Last week I asked you, have you ever in your life at one time or another questioned God's love for you? Have you ever doubted God's love for you? Have you ever faced circumstances that cause you to say, why God, how can you let this happen to me? Today I am going to ask everyone to take two or three minutes. We're gonna say two minutes for time's sake. And look inside your Bible and find some inspiring biblical scriptures, verses about God's love for you, God's love for us. So everybody, just take a moment, you know, take a few minutes, you know, well, two minutes, look inside your Bible and find a scripture that talks about God's love for us. Look inside your Bible and find a scripture that talks about God's love for us. God's love is unconditional. God is the one and only almighty God. He has supreme authority. God is a sovereign God. He is in control of the universe. He continues to rule. One more minute. I have one scripture text, Brother Clark. Who's that? Who said that? I used that for this morning's devotion in 2 John 1 and says, Verse 6, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. Amen. Brother Yukon? I, like, I like Romans 5, 8, when it says, but God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Amen. Christ died for us. Amen. Anybody in this section? Sister Janine. This is Mark's first John three one. It says, Behold what manner huh? That's what I said. I said three one. <laughs> <laughs> Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God, therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. 
Amen. Amen. Anybody in this section? Sister Eula? We got two people over here. Uh, John 3, 16. For God so Amen. loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Amen. Brother Clark. That's the one I had. Oh, that's the one you had? Brother Clark. Brother Clark. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I guess I'm out of line because he was going around. That's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to say um, John 15, 13. Greater love has no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friend. Man. Uh, 1 John 5 and 14. This is the confidence we have. This is NIV. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whenever we ask, we know that we we know that what we have, we know that we have what we ask of him. Amen. Anybody in this section? Going once, twice, three times. Anybody else in this section? Anybody? Oh, sorry. We got Brother Allen with his hand up. Titus 2, starting with verse 11. For the grace of, and this is NIV, uh, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glo glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Amen. Uh, one more. One more. Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> this is from Rocky. Um, this is uh, John... 13, 34, and 35. A new command I give you, love Amen. one another as I have loved you, mm -hmm. so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Amen. Anyone else? Just a challenge, you know, we'll keep moving. Somebody was over here? Okay, one more over here. Sister Tangela. And this will be the last one over here. John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd and knoweth my sheep, and I am known of mine. Amen. The Lord has appeared. This is Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord has appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Amen. So we see that God's love is unconditional. And we know that God's love is unconditional. But the people still asked, wherein have you loved us? God's love is unconditional. In Psalm 63, verse 3, the Bible reads, My lips praise you because your faithful love is better than life itself. Psalms 86, 15, but you, my Lord, are a God of compassion and mercy. You are very patient and full of faithful love. And we got other verses, Zechariah 3, 17, 1 John 3, 1. And it's a whole bunch of scriptures. And you guys did well on that. People may pride themselves that they are God's people. Somebody said something? Oh, okay. Yet displease him through living to, play, to please themselves. Malachi learns through experience that when such people are rebuked, they usually take offense. Their reaction 
is to the point out, their reaction is to point out in a hurt tone of voice that they are innocent and have been treated unfairly. So, you know, why do we, when, when God is pouring out our sins or one of our sisters and brothers uh, come to us and is pointing out our sins, our errors, why do we get defensive? Truth hurt. Truth hurts. Who said that? <laughs> hey, amen. Truth hurts. Wow. Well, we can't get no better than that one, huh? <laughs> amen. Yesterday in our Galatians class, um, we talked about the fact that Paul withstood Peter to his face, and later Peter called him his beloved brother. Many times when we are corrected by one another, you know, our attitude should be, uh, instead of being defensive, you know, William used to say all the time, ask yourself, is it true? You know, before you, before you respond, mm -hmm. ask yourself, is it true? Mm -hmm. Is it possible that I could be doing that? Maybe I'm mm -hmm. not aware of it. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to ask yourself sometimes, is it true? And then if it's mm -hmm. the truth, then make that correction. And then be grateful to the person who brought it to your attention because they're trying to help save your soul. They're not trying Amen. to condemn you, you know. And that's why when we go to each other, we must go in love and we must talk to someone like we would want to be talked to. Hey, Amen. That's important. Attitude. We got to have the right attitude. I, I remember when Brother Hogan was here, he was saying, some of y'all can't, can't go to people and talk. <laughs> some of y'all can't go to people and correct them because you, you just don't have the right attitude. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, the people's main complaint is that God does not love them. If he does, they argue, let him prove it to them by giving them comfort and prosperity instead of hardship and poverty. Have you ever asked God to prove his love to you? Oh, you got a question over there? Have you ever asked God to prove his love to you? Because these people are asking God to prove his love to them. These are God's chosen people. These are God's chosen people. But because of their Situations, their circumstance. No. Because of God chastising them for their unbelief and their sins. Just like you have to chastise your child. You know, God chastise us. Because they, they didn't have the comfort, you know, and all the amenities and, you know, Things that they, they just thought they deserved to have. They question God's love for them. You know, and sometimes, you know, we, we take our minds off of Christ and we look at other things that other people have. We see how other, we got a song about that, how other people prosper. Ain't that right? Don't we got a song about that? How other people prosper? You know, how, how sinful people sometimes prosper? But we always have to stay focused on Christ. And so let's, let's not look at these people too harshly. Because this can happen to us. Right. My sister? Yeah, um, 
And I was thinking exactly what you were saying, that this is, we're still like this today. Mm -hmm. um, according to 1 John 5, 5 and 3, you know, God, I, I'm sorry, uh, God's word and his commandments should never be burdensome to us. But we, we don't, um, we think too much like the world. And when we don't get our way, that's mm -hmm. when I think all those rituals come into play because mm -hmm. especially in, <clears throat> in denominational churches, mm -hmm. you know, just studying God's word, which is why I love this congregation, mm -hmm. particularly because, you know, I know that Brother Mark tries desperately to stick with God's word. Mm -hmm. and, and when in other, in other uh, denominations, when they don't stick with God's word, that's when all these rituals start to come into play because they're trying to draw people into themselves and not to God. Amen. Well said. Amen. Their reaction is to point out in a hurt tone of voice that they are innocent and have been treated unfairly. In what way have you loved us? You know, I'm, I'm innocent, God. Tell me how you love me. I mean, you, you've been treating us unfairly. Okay, well, we, we, we sinned, and, you know, you took us through all that trauma. But you've been, you've been treating us unfairly, God. So tell us. Explain to us, in what way have you loved us? Can you imagine your son, your daughter, your grandchild telling you or questioning you, in what way have you loved me? After you've done everything that you possibly can, You've done everything that you possibly can. You've been with them through thick and thin, trials and tribulations. You were there when they didn't even know you were there. Just like these people. God was there all the time for them. When they were going through those trials and tribulations, when they were experiencing all that trauma, God was there. But still they said, in what way have you loved us? Can someone read where it says, yeah. on page eight of the workbook, where it says, cornerstone. Can someone read where it says, in Malachi, one, two, eight, God said, Page eight, and we're going to wrap it up there and God continue said, next week. I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, in what way have you loved us? God immediately confronts his people with the heart of the issue. He confronts the spirit responsible for the spirit of apathy. He does so by quoting their own words and repeating their own thoughts. God diagnose, diagnoses of the root cause of their spiritual lethar, lethargy and indifference was the cynicism that exists in the hearts of his people concerning his love for them. God Amen. That's good. That's good right there. And you know, this, this story of Esau and Jacob begins in Genesis chapter 25, I believe around verse 19. We're going to wrap it up right here, and we're going to come back. So I ask that you study up and come back with all of your...